Hi, ADHE 412. My name is Paula and my teammates are Will and Christina. For our creative artifact, we decided to conduct an interview between a talk show host named Tina, the founder of the Black Lives Matter movement, and a famous adult educator, Paul, Paulo Fry. We believe that a talk show artifact would be interesting and an educational method to showcase all the things we have learned this semester in ADHE, as well as, its, as, well as the Black Lives Matter and its relevance for adult education. As you'll see in our video, adult education has proven to be extremely important in the movement. As many people are visual learners, we thought showcasing this as a talk show would allow people to absorb the information easier and it would be more enjoyable to watch. Now before we get into our talk show, we wanted to give you guys a brief overview of what exactly the Black Lives Matter movement is. Right now in America, it's a chapter-based organization that's goal is to end the racism and discrimination against Black people. Black Lives Matter is an attempt to liberate not only Black people, but all oppressed people, including the LGBT community. Thus far, there's been more than 50 organizations that have joined the movement, which represents thousands upon thousands of individuals. The demands for Black Lives Matter are to end the war on Black people, further investment in education, health, and safety for Black people, as well as Black political power. Black Lives Matter was formed in July of 2013 after George Zimmerman was acquitted for the mur murder of Trayvon Martin. It also gained further momentum a year later when Michael Brown was shot dead. At this point in time, he was unarmed with his hands up. As said best on the Black Lives Matter website, the call for Black Lives to Matter is a rallying cry for all Black lives striving for liberation. Hi everyone, welcome. My name is Tina Smith and welcome to the Tina Talk Show. Thank you so much for tuning in. For today's special, we have a special guest coming in to talk about the Black Lives Matter movement, which has risen to prominence in our society. Please welcome our first guest, the co-founder of the Black Lives Matter movement, and an absolutely amazing woman and leader, Alicia Garza. Hi, thank you so much for joining us on today's talk show and sharing your experiences with the Black Lives Matter movement. Thanks for having me, it's really, it's really an honor to be here. I guess for our first question today, we would like to know more about how you and your co-founders started up Black Lives Matter and how you were able to achieve this growth. Uh, yeah, so I started up Black Lives Matter with uh, two of my sisters, Patrice Coors and Opal Tomiti. Um, I can remember sitting in the bar with my friends in Oakland, California and watching the acquittal of George Zimmerman on the news. Um, it was like a punch in the gut though, because Martin could have easily been my brother, um, a gentle six foot, 25 year old with a big afro uh, who could never hurt a fly. So um, I guess Black Lives Matter initially started as a call for action on behalf of the black community after Trayvon Martin um, was murdered. And the movement is a response to the racism against blacks within society. And it has also turned into like an ideological uh, political intervention. Um, and it's a way for us to band together against the oppression as well as recognize the contributions that black people have had uh, towards the society. Um, yeah, and it, also on top of that, um, I guess the bottom line would be that the Black Lives Matter movement is playing off of the Black Liberation Movement. Um, it's continuing that, and it has been a result of, that has been a result of state violence and uh, deprivation of Black uh, human rights. Um, yeah, it first started as a hashtag actually, oh, wow. and a large part of the growth the growth was attributed to uh, social media outlets. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what increased the participation in the movement. Yeah, it really has been astounding, the growth in the movement, but has it been difficult to, count, to counteract it to simply just becoming a social media movement? Um, yes, so it's, it's been a little bit difficult from getting past that uh, social media to the outside world. Um, people are more um, busy liking and retweeting um, yeah. than actually participating in person um, or talking about it and organizing in person. And I guess that's the struggle nowadays is that technology is making it a little bit harder for participation and it's definitely changing how people participate. Yeah. Um, today we're actually going to be having a famous adult educator join us to talk more about this. So please everybody welcome the famous Paul Fry. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me. Hi Alicia, Hi. it's a pleasure to meet nice you. Nice to meet you. And honestly, <clears throat> you know, I'm really glad that you started this movement. Uh, you know, I can see it perpetually forward into a lifetime, and people will carry on this movement's concepts uh, through generations, and hopefully we will really start to see the problems in our society change for the better. 
Uh, yes, it's a pleasure to meet you too. Um, our movement actually has looked into a lot of your work, um, and I feel like our pedagogy is tying very closely with your educational theory. Um, I'm not an educator, educator myself, um, but I've definitely heard that term before, uh, like long education, and I see that the Black Lives Matter movement is a great example of this concept. Um, the segregations of blacks has been something that's continuously happened within our society and history and, and continues to perpetuate itself throughout um, our lives. Um, tying it to adult education, um, I can see in the past movement, starting back with uh, Lincoln's push to end slavery, um, he thought that was wrong. And yes, slavery ended, but then this problem of discrimination definitely continued. Um, and then generations later came along, uh, came Martin Luther King along with Rosa Parks, who started the bus, the bus boycott, and Malcolm X, and they all pushed for African American rights and the end of segregation. Um, so I can definitely see it perpetuating through lifetimes in the future. The history of these movements is absolutely incredible. And Paulo, could you shed some further light on your personal outlooks of today's society and the behaviors within society? Yeah, no, for sure, for sure. Uh, you know, I, I believe that there's a lot of problems within our society today. A lot of people hide behind the screens of technology and they're not actually on the streets uh, pushing for change. And I believe that active participation and involvement is really the first step to create this vertically integrated system of learning. And this is so important because uh, if we can get the millennials of tomorrow to really change the way they view the world, uh, you know, I really believe that the world tomorrow will be a, a lot better. And I believe that you know, freedom is something that's acquired by conquest. You know, it's not a gift. It's not something that's just handed down to us. It's something that we have to consistently pursue. And it's something that we have to chase for a lifetime in order to really achieve it. Paulo, I can see that you're so passionate about this topic. Is there one thing that is really irritating you about society today? Yeah, definitely. Uh, one thing that's just really irritating me uh, that was, was really the death of Sandra Bland. Uh, her death was classified as a suicide. Uh, and I guess there's been a lot of protests around the issue and a lot of people are thinking that it's an act of violence uh, against African Americans. And ultimately, you know, she got pulled over by the cop uh, and was arrested for no reasonable grounds. And, um, you know, they say that she was irritated, but of course she was irritated. She didn't know uh, what, what, what reason, what reason she would be, uh, she was going to be arrested for. And I guess she ended up dying in jail. And that's just so, that's just so sad because, uh, and it's, because it's just, she died in jail and that's partly attributed to the, the violence that might, may, may have happened and that, the, you know, the county has been hiding. And I think that's just so unacceptable and that, uh, th this is why horizontal education is so important because it sheds light uh, towards these issues, uh, raises awareness, and and I'm just so glad that we have people like Alicia who are really pushing for change in this area. Yeah, I completely agree with you. That's unacceptable. I'm actually pretty familiar mm -hmm. with that instance, um, and this is why this is the reason why Black Lives Black Lives Matter exists, um, so that we don't have people end up like Sandra Bland, and we're continuing to push for this change and in our society and bring equality uh, towards African Americans. Mm -hmm. That story is just so disturbing, and what's craziest is that these stories aren't in isolation. Dr. Fry, could you just give us a quick summary of your theory behind education yeah. and the pedagogical underpinnings you believe in? Of course. Uh, the radical and critical philosophy behind what I believe in is based around the criticism of education, that learners uh, are, are ultimately empty, and teachers just fill them with knowledge, and this promotes passivity. Instead, I believe that learning is fostered uh, from experience and realization of learners. Uh, and their position within society and how they're ranked and whether or not that's fair. You know, they can really assess. And from there, you know, what I'm most concerned is about how oppressed individuals are forced into a state of powerlessness and silence. And my theory really suggests that oppressed people can really change their situation in their lives if they participate and get involved. I also feel like the Black Lives Matter movement also has a similar underpinning to this. Now, Alicia, how do you see pedagogy behind the movement you created linked with this notion of critical philosophy? Um, yeah, so well, I can see it pertaining very much to why the movement sparked so much participation in the first place. Um, because the, the oppressed of individuals did realize that their place in society and they did realize that it was unfair and um, that it was not liberating and not equal to the rights of whites. Um, and again and again, black people are condemned to this fair and racist treatment. Um, if we simply attribute our situation to something or someone above us um, and believe that we cannot do anything to change our situation, then we will definitely be further subject to the racism um, that's entrenched within our society. Definitely.
definitely. Uh, you know, yeah, that situation you're describing is called natural consciousness. Mm -hmm. And essentially it means that the oppressed cannot control the situation and it's hopeless. In order for a change to occur, uh, you know, we, we really need to view the situation as controllable. Mm -hmm. And they need to take on the idea of critical consciousness, where the oppressors uh, have to believe that they have the power to liberate themselves as well as, uh, uh, as, well as the oppressed. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, only the oppressed really have the power uh, and determination uh, to liberate themselves from the situation. Yeah, that's so true. Um, the problems associated with racism mm -hmm. definitely stem from the top of our society, such as the government, the police force, public education. I agree. Um, however, this does not mean we do not have the power to change mm -hmm. this corruption. Definitely. Um, yeah, that's exactly what the Black Lives Matter, is, um, Black Lives Matter movement <laughs> is doing. Why do you think um, it's been so difficult for change to occur? Like, like after all, there's been problems since like the end of all time, but since the 60s, there's been um, human rights movements. That It's been 50 years since then. Uh, yeah, biggest thing we noticed um, in on that sense is that to have a liberating education for everybody, mm -hmm. um, there would need to be some sort of political power, and we just have yet to see a strong enough educational advocate for that in the government. No, definitely. You know, just to really echo that, uh, systematic education uh, can only be changed by political influence. However, I, I really see that educational projects should really be put forth uh, by, by, by the oppressed uh, in an organized manner, and I think that will really be the first step to uh, producing change. These educational projects seem really interesting. How would you apply these educational projects in the Black Lives Matter movement, Asia? Um, yeah, so right now uh, we have meetings, we have teach-ins, panels, uh, we have Twitter chats, and we also started a, a youth empowerment strategy program, um, just to name a few of our programs. Uh, the goal of these non-formal and informal educational opportunities are to um, spread awareness regarding the movement and empower our supporters and just help them develop those skills um, needed to better navigate the society as an African. No, I actually really like that idea, Alicia, and uh, I think that formal education is really not the only way to teach people these days. Uh, and you can really learn from all sorts of sources, uh, you know, whether informal, non-formal, uh, or formal. And I believe that the biggest issue right now is that many Americans, again, are condemned to that culture of powerlessness and silence. And to what extent do ordinary people really have the intellectual, intellectual tools uh, and the understandings uh, to change this discourse? Uh, and I guess today, another issue today is that uh, the dominant public uh, discussion has always been to have a tendency to really blame the victims. Mm -hmm. And I, I really see this is why these educational projects are so good, just because they shift away from that traditional education system uh, and that traditional banking education where we consistently feed students knowledge. And they simply regurgitate it without really understanding it or processing it. So Alicia, you know, I really believe that uh, this method you propose is really an excellent way uh, to, to develop this idea where different generated themes are developed uh, and structured around these activities that people have, and that really changes the way they learn in a, in a more um, in a method that's more reflective of the real world. Yeah. yeah. For our final question today, I was just wondering, Alicia, what exactly do you want to see out of the Black Lives Matter movement? Um, change. We want to ignite change. We want to spread awareness. We want to challenge the injustices. Um, we ultimately do. We just want the structures in America to change and. Uh, the oppression uh, of black people to stop. Um, it's, it's not an anti-police movement, it's not an, a movement against white people, it's just a movement of injustice. Alicia, that's a really interesting point of view and I agree with that. You know, one of the problems that I see today, really uh, humanization and dehumanization, and kind of the values that revolve around that has been a huge topic of debate within modern society today. Um, I guess within, with regards to dehumanization, it was a large concern within African Americans. Uh, and what that really means is that, you know, it's, it's their identities and people who've stolen their identities. And I believe that that's what made Black Lives Matter just, just so great in that it pushes for equality amongst African Americans. Uh, and really, I, I think that people should not be discriminated for the pigment of their skin. Uh, and Black Lives Matter really reminds African Americans that they're just as human as everyone else. And really, I guess one of the things that really uh, breaks my heart is that I found out in 2015 that a police killed more than a hundred unarmed African Americans. And, I mean, that comes up to like twice a week. Uh, and that's really just un absolutely unacceptable. You're right, this is just 
That's totally unacceptable, and I guess that's what Black Lives Matter is all about, pushing for involvement and awareness from the rest of society mm -hmm. to recognize that we need to continually learn throughout our lives to understand the continual changing social issues. Thank you so much for joining me today. That's all the time we have left, but it was really great getting to talk to you guys. No worries. Thank you so thank much, you. Kara. It was a pleasure to meet you and speak to you guys, and thank you. Tune in next week. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching our talk show. Just in closing right now, we're gonna go over some of the reflections we made and some insights. For our creative artifact, we wanted to have fun and incorporate some of our own interests, such as talk shows. We thought it would be important to do something that we would enjoy as would aid to the overall education of our piece. We thought a talk show would be a great way to show what we have learned in the course. Additionally, all three of us had heard of Black Lives Matter. However, we desired to know more and how it could relate to the course. Through this assignment, we gained a huge appreciation for the movement, as well as the pedagogy that has aided the movement. As this was a distance education course, interaction had only been online up until this point. This project helped reinforce the ideas of working together. We learned how to collaborate ideas, share how each of us had interpreted certain concepts, such as non-formal versus informal education, and also learned tangible skills such as editing and filming. It was a really great way to tie the overall concepts of this course into something that is currently happening today. One huge um, moment of insight for us was when we applied um, Paulo Frey's work to the Black Lives Matter movement. Frey had always been hesitant to apply his findings to the developed world, but we found the Black Lives Matter movement actually fit into his thinking extremely well. One huge um, struggle we actually had in making our talk show was that some of the philosophies were extremely wordy and we thought that it might be difficult to understand, but we think we overcame this by making the talk show more educational-based. We can see that education has aided marginalized people as well as just your ordinary people. Education has the ability to empower individuals, which will cause change. Thanks so much for watching.